Bart and Mike, how you guys doing? Good. Great. So you guys, as always, are busy. I feel like there's always something going on with Mercy Me. Um, although this album, which is really interesting to me, you guys spent like a little over two years on Inhale, Exhale, correct? Yeah, we did. It was it was um, it started out as just lazy and then it became intentional. And yeah. we were, you know, our first single Almost Home will be a year and a half old by the time the album releases, which is weird. And it, it released the fall of 19. And so the album ideally would have released like the beginning of 2020. And we were we were already missing the deadline because because that laziness and then the pandemic hit and then it was like we slowed everything way down just to have something to work on daily and to go like we had, we bought a studio this studio about two years ago thank goodness and so we had somewhere to go and to feel normal like i i'm 90 percent kidding when i say it saved our lives and maybe our marriages too almost definitely yeah <laughs> and uh, yeah. our sanity for sure yeah and in the in the meantime we kind of in a way, it felt like we kind of wiped the slate clean and just uh, we even, I mean, the changed the album title, wrote a bunch more songs and ended up with about 40 songs or so just to try to figure out, just to figure out what the album was going to look like. And and uh, that's not wow. normally if we need 12 songs, we might write 13 if we're lucky. And I was so, just going to ask you that. I was just going to ask you, like, how many songs is it normal? So, yeah, so. Mike, let me ask you this, because I'm, I'm now I'm really interested. You end up with 40 songs. And then obviously not all of those songs are going to make it onto an album, right? So what, how painful is it to then separate from a lot of that music and figure out what you're going to use? I'm still pretty emotional about a couple of songs. One, oh, I won't, you know, <laughs> I, we have a long running joke about that. Yes. There is tons of songs that like are still kind of our babies. Like the, they're, and each of us probably would pick a different one that you just kind of connect to. And uh, so much so that we're actually probably going to make like, a, an extended edition or a second record that's going to come out a little faster than normal because we had so many songs come out in this season that we're just like we don't want these to just disappear into the ether and so uh yeah i man i don't i don't know if uh i don't know if we'll ever let go of some of them there, there there's some fun stuff that happened in the studio and i think a lot of that's because of the forced time that we had last year to to get together and work on it so so let's talk a little bit about COVID. I want to get a little more into the album because there's some really great stuff. There's one story in particular that I want to talk about. But you you guys, like everyone else, you're you're locked down, you're dealing with this. And you mentioned you had the studio. Thank God you had a place to kind of to kind of go. Um, but what Bart for you would you say? What are some of the lessons you took away? I think a lot of us we've talked negatively about COVID, obviously, because it's been a terrible thing on so many different levels. But what are some of the positives that came out of COVID or that you experienced during it? Well, we were very fortunate. My family, I have five kids and, and um, I, my whole family, we got COVID over Christmas. And fortunately, it was it was for the most part pretty mild. And um, and so, you know, but my oldest son is a type one diabetic and we kept they kept telling us, man, whatever you do, don't let him get it. So we lived in a in a, a healthy amount of fear you know, and rightfully so during the, the whole time for it to be pretty mild. I remember going, man, I couldn't be more grateful, but couldn't this have happened like in March, <laughs> you know, where you could have enjoyed our summer more, whatever. But that aside, like, um, you know, I think the first couple of months we kept thinking it's a, it's about to be over, you know, this is like a 30 day break or whatever. And whenever that time set into where, wait, this, we don't know what's, what's going on. Um, yeah, I just, I, it's, I tried to get acclimated. It's almost like the first time I ever went on a cruise, the first couple of days, I thought I was a caged animal and like walking from one end of the boat going, I can't do this. Then you start slowing down and you're like, oh, maybe I can do this. Like when you get used to it. And that's kind of what it felt like, like, um, after the initial panic of, you know, what's going to happen with all the unknown stuff at some point I realized, okay you know, this, hopefully this will never happen again. And this is not like going on vacation where there are deadlines and some catching up to do. We've all been put on hold and we, there are no deadlines. We don't know what's happening next. And so when I got to that point, I realized, man, today, the most important thing that's going to happen is what flavor ice cream are me and my 11 year old daughter going to eat today. And man, and once that settled in, that that's all that mattered, it, 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 it became like a pretty beautiful season for there for a little bit of just, a, you know, uh, I'm one, 
I'm never going to get this back, but especially I'm never going to get it back at the age that my kids are at. And so yeah, to be able to stop all this and to, and to, and to genuinely put everything I have into whatever they're into and whatever it's just, you know, it, it, and that's what I love about the record. I've, I've said that the record special to me, cause it's kind of like a, a timestamp of what we've gone through and, or postcard, we should have called a postcard from the pandemic. No, we shouldn't. But uh, that's what it feels like is because, like, there's so much attachment. What is on the other side of that postcard? I don't right, know. Exactly. I don't know what the image is. But. Yeah. So the time in my family, uh, especially that since I travel for a living normally, is, uh, you know, I'll be a grandfather and there'll be adults. And we'll still talk about this season, about how precious the, the way we not that it's a vacation, but my kids will talk about a trip to Disney there'll be a time they talk about the year that we had together when nothing else mattered. And uh, that unique time together, (laughs) right? That unique. And and we've had that too in our house where you're spending so much time. You're never going to spend that much time together again. And I think people joked about it in the beginning. You know, I remember my, my kid, she drew a picture of all of us and it was like together forever. And we were laughing about it. It was during the pandemic because we're like, we really are (laughs) trapped in this townhouse together forever. But, but it was like, you know, we look back at it now and it's, things are starting to change a little bit, but it really was a unique time. Uh, Mike, what about for you? Were there any big lessons, even with the album that sort of made it different, yeah. obviously, as you were recording? Yeah. I uh, I did not handle it as well as Bart. Um, I went through uh, like the the emotional roller coaster and probably dabbled in depression some, which I never really have. Um, and I was joking with a friend the other day saying that like, uh, even though all of my friends in the music industry would probably punch me in the face for saying this, I kind of wish I could go back to last May and start over because that's when I, I really kind of... Um, I just lost I, I lost the 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 notion of where my hope and where my joy actually lies. And it's not in my circumstances because obviously last year's circumstances weren't great. Um, and so I, I kind of wish I could go back and do it over again um, with that in mind. It, it slipped away until probably late in the fall when my wife um lovingly kicked me in the buttocks um, <laughs> several times emotionally and spiritually to remind me, you know, you know, this is, this is about a bigger thing. And, and, and that's when I was kind of clued in, you know, six months after this guy realizing, man, this is a really special thing or can be, and there's definitely silver linings in in the middle of it. Well, and what you just said though, is so true. I mean, so many people have experienced the pain and the suffering and the depression who haven't experienced that before. And others who traditionally have, you know, really experiencing that in an elevated way. And so I love that you shared that because I think for, for so many, this has been such a bizarre season, but we've seen the statistics and the headlines about the struggles that kids and adults are having all over, you know, all over the country as this, you know, persists. And you know, when I think about <clears throat> your new album and I think about the music, one of the things that really stuck out to me is the single um, Say I Won't. And I want to talk about that because usually uh, people who are making music, musicians, they they tend, it seems, to sing and, and perform about their own experience. In this case, it seems like what you were doing, well, it doesn't seem like it, it is what you were doing, was talking about someone else's experience, someone you knew, someone who's important to you. So, Bart, can you explain the the story behind Say I Won't? Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Like I lament well, I've learned and all the songs that are important to me came out of personal experience and things that I've gone through. And, uh, and I don't think I've ever written a song kind of with someone else and not, uh, you know, I don't say it's about him, but it, cause it's not telling a story directly, but it is because of him. And, um, um, and so it was a weird different, like, there's no pressure on me because I'm very forgiving if I'm telling my own story or writing, but there was a weird pressure of like, man, I hope that he's, he's okay with this and he's proud or whatever. But so when I first started writing the song, most people don't know, uh, I started writing in 2019, I believe. And Gary miracle, who, uh, was our first merch guy 25 years ago is Mike's roommate. He's been a dear friend of ours for a long time. I went through a, uh, this kind of, a um, it was like discovering fire identity in Christ and grace and this whole thing that st- things I never really learned in the kind of legalistic church I grew up in. And, um, and Gary kind of came out of a similar place. And so for a couple of years, we had an ongoing text conversation, him going, now, hold on. You're saying on my worst day that not only is Jesus okay with me, he's pleased with me. And we're you know kind of unpacking this stuff, telling him about books to read and so some of the lines from the song, like the one that says uh, driving 35 with a rocket inside, didn't know what I had 
was something that I said to Gary, like, you know, I would tell him these things like, man, when we realize what's inside of us, everything changes. So the verses are about, they start as identity. Well, then, you know, for multiple reasons, it's, it's not uncommon for me to set the song aside uh, and work on other stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, pandemic starting to hit and Gary got really sick in December of uh, 2019 and, and uh, had this blood infection and they thought uh, they were going to lose him and had him on life support. And, and they knew that when they realized that they're going to save him, they knew that they were probably going to take his limbs. And, um, and so by the time pandemic hit, we're watching from a distance and just, and just engulfed in the story. And it just, when I went back to finish say I won't it it became like this overcomer kind of rocky type song of like I dare you to tell me I can't do something which was also inspired by Gary and so you know Gary was kind of all over this song and so when we finished I abs- like I none of the other rest the album wasn't even close to being done but I told the label this has to be the first single we all agreed and and because we couldn't tour we couldn't get out there we were like okay we need to do a video that's that really hits home and like affects people because we can't go see them. We can't promote this any other way. And so I remember the label came to me and said, Hey, we've heard about this family. It was like, it was about somebody that maybe had ALS, something like that, but we didn't know them. Maybe do the video about them. And it felt really slimy to like, I it feel like I'm exploiting these strangers to sell my song. And so couldn't do it. And then in that, just kind of brought up that, and I don't think I realized how much Gary was a part of the song until I just started talking about it. And, and, uh, and, and Gary had already said, told me he was like going through it. He was like, man, I, I want there to be a purpose for this. I want people to be inspired by, uh, you know, my story to overcome whatever they're facing is, but I don't think I'm there emotionally to, you know, to step on stage or whatever that quick. And, and I just said, man, I said, would you ever let us tell your story for you and do the heavy lifting? And and he was in tears. He was like, man, he goes, yeah, we've been praying for, you know, he never thought it'd be this, but he's praying for just opportunities that he could be a part of and gradually kind of ease into. And so, man, we, we, we made the video. We did it ourselves. It turned out way better than we ever thought possible. And um, and it's it's been funny to watch Gary now because he's kind of like I say we've created a monster because like every day he's like, hey, it's not running up the charts as fast or what's going on. <laughs> and I'm like, easy there, pal. Like we got this, you know, and but it's cool because, it, you know, he's told me before that, you know, he'll wake up and just it, whether it's an email from someone that saw the video or just keeping up with where the song is that he's like, man, there are moments when I forget that I'm stuck to a wheelchair. And uh, and uh, and he goes in that, you know, he, he every tiny moment he's, you know, cr- he's so grateful for. And so it's been cool to, to be on this journey with him. Um, you know, there's a tr- there's a level of trust between all of us that that's, you know, that you can't. It's 25 years old. Yeah. And uh, and so, right. yeah, it's a deep friendship. And really then- having this, you know, deep meaning to this song and, you know, Mike, for you, what is it like knowing a lot of people make music and they just make music and and that's it. And they're there, they're doing it to entertain people. And there's nothing more to it. When you guys do that, you're entertaining people, but there's something so much deeper going on. What is it like for you, Mike, kind of knowing that a song like that actually changes people's lives and their perspectives and hopefully they're where they're heading eternally? Yeah, uh, it's huge. I mean, we, we've always kind of said when people ask why we chose Christian music, we always the answer has always been it, it's not, it wasn't really a choice. Like a, songwriters are going to write about what's the most important thing to them. And for us, that's our relationship with Christ and the way that's changed us. And so the songs are naturally coming out as that. The fact that these songs connect with people and, and change their lives the way our lives have been changed is absolutely humbling. And now in this season when it's like, not only is it like affecting strangers, but like this is one of our dear friends that this song is connected to and like seeing how it's given him new purpose in the midst of like, I thought my 2020 was bad. Gary Miracle's 2020 was bad. And yeah. and he still has hope and he still is is um, like he literally embodies the idea of say I won't to the point of the day we were filming the music video. He got a phone call from his prosthetician, the 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 prosthetics doctor. And they were like encouraging him, hey, man, we're going to get you scheduled to get fitted for your new legs. You should be standing and walking in a year. And three months later, he was standing up for the first time. 
And uh, it, it's just, it's knowing that like we can just help encourage him and then knowing, hearing the stories from him of the people who, the vets who have reached out to him, the 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 kids who are in the hospital who have reached out to him. One kid who uh, he talked to, I, I think I think maybe the kid had cancer. Gary's like, man, I'm taking you to Disney World. Like, we're going to go together and we're going to, you know, we get to skip all the lines. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, it's just like this, this connection that's happening in the ministry that he's able to just pour into people's lives because, you know, we had a th- three minute song, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It blows my mind that God uses these things. Well, and I love that you guys knew from the beginning, like this is going to be the first single. We, this is what we want this yeah. to be. And that it's had such an impact hearing that, hearing that story alone. And I know there's so many others now, as we inch toward the end here, I, I got one more question and Bart, I'm going to throw it to you because, and I've asked you this in the past, but I'm fascinated by the answer because not a lot of people, not a lot of bands have been together as long as you guys have. And anybody knows, you know, people drive each other crazy, bands break up. What is the secret that has kept you guys together? And how do you navigate those? I'm sure there, there are always bumps in the road for any, you know, relationship in any sort of group. But how have you done it? How have you kept the, you know, the band together for so long? We all desperately want to avoid hard labor. And so uh, we uh, we're very good at that. And uh, no, man, I I mean, I compare it to a marriage on certain levels to where it's like where like divorce isn't an option. It's like it's just it's not a it's it's just not really in our vocabulary of like, uh, you know, if I were to call it quits or I don't know about the rest of the guys, if I were to call it quits, it's because I'm not making music anymore. Like I have no desire to make music on my own or with anyone else. And so it's either I'm doing this or I'm not. And, um, and, and so, and we just, we still love what we do. We love making music. It's, it's the greatest job in the world. And, and, uh, it's funny because I don't think we realize how special it is to be a band for 27 years and, uh, get along as well as we do. And, yeah. and but it's like everybody else, uh, you know, they that are around us are like, man, this is so weird. Like you guys genuinely like each other. Like we were done at five and you stayed till midnight just goofing off <laughs> the five of you. What is wrong with you? And it's yeah. like, yeah. And, and, and it's true. We did a video for uh, one of the songs with Steve Taylor and uh, who's, you know, been around. He's an icon. And, and uh, you know, and we he did the video. And afterwards, he kept saying during the day, he was like, man, he goes, you guys really like each other. Like you really like each other. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we do. Like, why is everybody freaked out by this? And he sent us an email and said, hey, guys, he goes, the last video I realized that I did was 22 years ago was Kiss Me for Sixpence on the Richer in Paris, France. And he goes, this has been the most enjoyable thing is if I was ever going to come out to do another video, I would do it with you guys because you you have such a joy around each other. And like you just started, like you just signed your first deal and the world is in right in front of you. He goes, I would never guess that you've done this for so long. And, and it's like, the more we see that, the more we realize, okay, this is pretty special. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's, I don't know what it is, but yeah, we, yeah. Okay. I'm okay. oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. And we don't hug. hug. It's, the key is to not hug. <laughs> no hugging. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's rare. No, it's 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 absolutely rare, which is why I always bring it up because and you got I feel like every time you make music, there's something unique and different about it. Like you I feel like you've done everything and every song is different. And that that might sound like a weird statement, but it's actually a really positive statement because sure. It's fi- it's fine when a band always sounds the same. There are some bands they just they set that's the music they make, but you guys are always doing something different. And I think that is another unique facet of mercy me right and so i commend you guys that, for that that means a lot because that's a goal of ours we don't ever want to make the same album twice and uh and that's always been our goal and there's a lot of different musical influences that we each have that all run through this mercy me filter but that's always been a goal is to just try and keep it fresh not just for the listener's sake but for our own like we don't want to make the same music every time so yeah that means a lot she said that and the rule is uh, all five plus our producers, I guess we all have to agree that it's worth being on the album. Um, and if there's one that's like, I don't know, it doesn't, I don't, it doesn't, I can't think of a time where it made it. Like there's bright side wow. of bro was a great example. Yeah. Like I was normally, a, I think I can push a song through if I'm super excited about it and I finished it <laughs> because me just finishing a song is a milestone. And, um, and I think one of the first ones I finished, I was so proud of it. And I think it was Mike that was like, no, it's, it's, it's okay. And I was so offended. Like you're making fun of my children. 
And uh, as mad as I was, I was so mad because I knew it's not going on the record. That's why I was mad. I wasn't mad that he didn't like it. I was mad because I knew that I can't just go, well, you don't know what you're talking about. It's going to go on there because that's kind of the way it's always been. So it is hard to find. I mean, if, if this, I mean, I believe that it, it's hard to find songs that we all agree on. And if we do, if it goes through that process, at least for us, we know that, well, it's good enough that five different guys that love music are digging it. I mean, that's kind of enough for us. Like, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's never a sense of uncertainty when the album releases on our part of like, did we make the right call? Uh, and if there is, then somebody's not speaking up. But well, uh, and the the flip side of that is that song "Bright Side of Broken," like it pushed him back to the drawing board, and he came back with like the the lyric was always great. The it was just it wasn't joined with the right music, and he went back to the drawing board on his own and just sat down at a piano and came up with what's perfect to where it's probably one of the more important songs on the record that I think is going to really connect with people. And so I think it it uh it's it's always good that we all have input, and it's not just one voice speaking into it. I think it, it well, ends it's up paid making- off. <laughs> it's paid off. Your music has reached a lot of people and a lot of people love it. And, and that's a great process to make sure everyone's on board, you know, before you do it. So I have to ask you the final thing. And this is a question. I don't even know why I ask it because I feel like everyone knows where to go to get the things they want, but I still want to offer you guys a chance to say, Hey, where can people go to grab the album? If they want to get it, is there a particular website or place you want to push people to? I'd go to our MySpace page. Yeah, or yeah. LimeWire. Is that <laughs> the little thing? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, oh, put your AOL MySpace, good, old my, good old Tom. Yeah, AOL yeah, CD in the Tom. computer. Go to CompuServe. And uh, yeah. sadly, we've been a band that long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we actually used to sell CDs. Yeah, yeah. That's really sad. we had cassettes too, maybe. I don't Here's know. how I bad it, it is. And we will get, we'll answer your question one day. But it, it's so bad that... <laughs> All five of us, I'm not kidding, have AOL emails. I, you know, I actually didn't even realize that that was still a thing until I oh, yeah. had to use it recently for something because I was yeah. working on a project and I was like, oh, wow, this is, and yeah. Yeah, it operates pretty well, shockingly, for being 50 yeah. years old. So I was, yeah. I was actually still paying for my AOL email address like <laughs> until like the mid to like the first decade of the 2000s. It was ridiculous. <laughs> no lie. Yeah. Like, whenever I'm like, it, if I'm in a store or something, they're like, oh, do you, can we get your email address? I'm like, it's this at. AOL. AOL. And you like, like you put your head down in yeah, shame. Yeah. Like, oh Lord, you need a parking handicap. You're old. And, yeah. But uh, oh, and but here's your senior discount. Everything is at mercyme.org. Uh, that's the easiest place. Um, yeah, and that's uh, if if you can't remember anything else, like everything goes through that at some point. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much. Congratulations on the album. It comes out April 30th, right? Yep. Yes. Sure does. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was great seeing you guys. Yeah, good seeing you. Thank you.